And here we are coming to you live once again from our top secret broadcasting facility here at Area 52, just outside of Bunkerville, Nevada. This is Pastor Mike, and I am online, and I got blessed today. I mean, I got blessed by a phone call that came in today, and wow. Um, I've, been te- I've been telling people that... The power of the Word of God. And, and the Bible says it. the Word is quick, which means it reads really fast. No, that's not what it means. The word quick means alive. And I would just ask you, what do you believe about your Bible? Is it alive or is it dead? And if you say that it's corrupted... Um, one of our one of our friends just emailed me a little while ago and he said that uh, somebody at a church told him that in the Luke rendering of the Lord's prayer I think it was for thine is the kingdom the power and the glory forever amen they told him that the King James translators added that and that it's not supported in the original manuscripts, which, of course, they don't have any of those original manuscripts. This guy apparently believes that the Word of God, the Bible, is corrupt, which means it has mistakes in it, flaws, errors, Nobody can really know for sure what the Bible says, that 1 John 5, 7 thing. You don't have to believe that if you don't want to. It's okay. But that's not what the Bible says about itself. Show show me the verse that says that the Bible is corrupt or will ever be corrupted. Show me where it will fall into disrepair. Show me where God never speaks any language other than Hebrew. Or Greek. Show me that one. And I'll show you verses that says God speaks all the language and the Holy Spirit gives utterance in other languages. So I believe the Word of God is powerful. It's quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. You know what, you know what all the other two-edged swords are? Go read Proverbs and find the strange woman in the book of Proverbs. Her mouth and her words are a sharp two-edged sword. You know how you defeat Jezebel? You have to have a sharper sword than she does. This is why I recommend to people, if they are going to engage in some sort of uh, doctrinal issue, they're going to engage on the Bible translation issue, they're going to engage on anything related to salvation or anything like that, I... I encourage you to use as much Bible verses as possible. Um, My pastor friend, Mike Hutzel, um, he had David Gibbs out. And this this is all has a purpose to it, by the way. I'm getting there, all right? Um, David Gibbs of the Christian Law Association, who uh, I've heard him speak. And uh, I can tell you that if, if I was ever in a town at one church speaking, and David Gibbs was across town at another church speaking, I would go and hear David Gibbs. Uh, Tremendous man. He's very brilliant. But I was told that he had said that in a court of law, he often goes and appears in courts for churches, him and his son, David Gibbs, the third or fourth or something like that. And these guys are all King James. He said, you go into court, and if anything of that church's doctrine is going to come up, you use a King James. Why? Because the King James Bible is actually a a law book. It contains legal ideas. It it contains legal doctrines and legal ideas that have been in place now for thousands of years. And it's just an amazing book. But it's sharper than any two-edged sword. So if if you're going to engage with Jezebel, I didn't say get engaged to Jezebel. Some of you already have. But if you're going to engage Jezebel in a conversation, 
You must use Scripture. Ask yourself the question, how was Jezebel killed? How was she killed? Because she went and tired her hair. She put a, she put a steel-belted radial tire on her hair. And she dolled her face all up, painted it, used crack sealer around, you know, the edges and things like that. And then she went and said, yoo And I, who was that? Jehu said, who's on the Lord's side here? Come on. Need some fellas out here. Somebody needs somebody to say amen. Two or three eunuchs. You know what that is? Two or three out of the mouth of two or three witnesses, let every word be established. Think about the two or three witnesses of the scripture, Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek. If any man speak in an unknown tongue, let it be by two or at the most three, and that by course, and then let one interpret. And those two or three eunuchs, who were never in a million years going to be turned on by Jezebel, picked her up as one man and tossed her out the window. I love that. If you're going to get into an argument with Jezebel, use as much scripture as you possibly do not count on and rely upon your own reasoning. Uh, nobody, if if somebody can listen to this, if somebody can change their mind based upon the words that you say, somebody else can come along and change their mind again. But I am I am living proof. That once the word of God gets in you, you never go back. You never do. Um, anyway, and I said all that to say this. Uh, if you have watched last weekend's uh, meeting down in Harrison, Arkansas, I preached uh, Don't Sell Your Vineyard. Uh, I made mention of Pastor Reg Kelly. Uh, he is the first guy I ever heard preach that message 14 years ago in that same place behind that same pulpit. It literally, literally, God emboldened me with that, with that message. We had that on CD. I think it's also on Sermon Audio. If you go to our, uh, if you just type in, don't sell your vineyard, Reg Kelly, I think you should be able to find it there. Outstanding message. But God used that message to embolden me. Um, which, by the way, I am going to Pastor Kelly's church this Sunday. Sunday school, Sunday morning, Sunday night. He's graciously given me all three of those. I'm looking forward to it. Um, he just a, he's a good friend, and I have other good friends that are in the ministry. They don't all agree with Mike Hoggard. Mike Hoggard don't all agree with them. So what? We all use the King James Bible. But if you heard what I said in Harrison last weekend, that has also been posted, you'll know that I was encouraging pastors when you preach Give them Bible verses. <clears throat> Read one right after another. Give them long strings of Scripture. Massive doses of the Word of God. If they need healing, he, the Bible says he sent his Word and healed them. And I'm just, a, I, I'm just somebody that God has put this in my heart to give Scripture, 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 because I think that's where all the answers are is in the Bible, in the Scripture. And I said all that to say this. I, I've told this story about the guy that goes into a laundromat, Roman Catholic, and he's on, on the folding table in this laundromat. Somebody has smeared Watchmen video broadcast DVDs all over the top of that table. They just had them smeared up there. And he's look, folding his clothes or something like that, and he's, he's looking at them. And one of them grabs his attention. I don't know which one it was, so he picked it up, took it home, popped it in the DVD player, watched it, got back in his car, went back to the laundromat, grabbed the rest of the DVDs off that table that somebody had smeared all over the top of that table and took them home with no thought whatsoever about anybody else who might want them. No, I'm just kidding. And he watched all of them. And he sent word to our ministry, and he said, I used to be Roman Catholic. He said, I'm not. I'm done. I'm out. I've asked God to save me. Amen. And you know what? Not because of the brilliant intelligence of Pastor Mike Hoggard. It has nothing to do with it. Doesn't have anything to do with my uh, amazing 
good looks. I promise you. Has nothing to do with um, the denominational ministry that we... No, we don't have that. It had everything to do with the words that God said going into this man's heart and, and, and reviving him from the dead works of sin. So I got a call this morning, and I tell that story every because it's just a, take the DVDs, get them from us, or copy them yourselves, and just start laying them everywhere. Now, I don't mean walk 12 miles out in the middle of the woods and drop one, unless you, of course, know that that's where somebody's deer stand is. But get copies or make copies and pass them around, give them to people. Why? Brother Weldon called me this morning, and he is from Newfoundland, or as they say, Newfoundland. And he had a gathering last night of some people, and he popped in one of the DVDs. And uh, he told me it was uh, the one on the Bible translations. <laughs> I've done like a hundred of those. Uh, I don't know which one it was. Maybe uh, which Bible you be the judge or something like that. Anyway, he popped that in, and everybody watched it. And he called, he called me to tell me this morning, 15 people were saved last night at this meeting. And he said most of these people already had different Bible translations. And he said they changed their mind last night. I, and I didn't do that. I take no credit for that whatsoever because that was the word of God doing that. And if God is the one who changes your mind, then your mind is in fact changed. Um, Brother Weldon told me that him and his whole family had come out of the charismatic church. Why? Because the charismatic church emphasizes your words over anything else in the world. It's witchcraft. We're going to talk about that today. We're going to talk about witchcraft. But I wanted to share that with everybody and encourage you. Um, encourage people like Dave and Anna Bradley out there uh, passing out tracts, giving out copies of John and Romans, giving out tracts with Bible verses on them. Uh, he sent me an email after I had mentioned him, I think it was on Tuesday's broadcast, he sent me an email and he said, Hoggy, he said the, uh, one of the cops that were asking what we were doing um, was looking at the tracks, and he said, you guys Jehovah's Witness? And he said, oh, no, no, no. He said, okay, you're fine. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Apparently the Jehovah's Witness are just as annoying in Italy as they are in the United States of America. But I want to encourage you, give, give the word of God to people. Make the devil mad. And I told Brother Weldon, I said, Here's what we're going to do, Brother Weldon. I'm going to pray for you, you and your guys and your people, and you guys pray for me. Because I promise you, every time the Word of God wins a battle, the devil goes out and licks his wounds, and then he comes back. And he's going to try to punish you. He's going to try to punish me. He's going to try to get at us for what it is that we did with the Word of God. We didn't hide it under a bushel. No, we didn't let it shine. And so you pray for Brother Weldon out there in Newfoundland and pray for all those people that uh, came to the Lord last night. And you pray for the, the word, pray that the, the word of God will increase. All right. I appreciate him calling me on that. Um, now, something else that may have, uh oh, I lost my earpiece. What? I can't, I can't hear me. What? I'm getting excited here. I wear two earpieces. One is the big one is linked into my um, my mixer board here so I can kind of hear what's going on. The other one is the feed that goes out, and there's like a one-second delay. And if you've ever tried to talk, listening to yourself with a one-second delay, you can't do it. It's it's just, just a mind thing. But we are, I'm not sure if it's going to be able to start today, but starting next Tuesday, at 12 p.m. noon central time, which would be 7 p.m. Kenya time, we're going to we've, we're going to set it up that KBTR Kenya Bible Truth Radio 91.1 FM. Michael came up with a slogan. It's called Watchman FM. I like it. I like it. 
Watchman FM out in Kenya is going to start broadcasting the Pastor Mike online live broadcast live over KBTR FM. That was just an idea. And I'm going, why haven't we been doing this already? And so anyway, uh, praise the Lord for that. What day is it today? It is Thor's day, but beside that, it is May the 1st, 2014. Now, what in the world does that have to do with anything? Well, if you are something that God said don't do, if you are an observer of times, then May 1st has a very, very high importance to you. You're going to perform rituals on May 1st that um, on any other day probably wouldn't have the power, quote-unquote, that doing rituals on May 1st has. Uh, And again, I always like to be G-rated when I do things like this, but May 1st, you can imagine it's springtime, there are fertility rituals that are performed May 1st every year. And the idea is that if you do a special something on a particular day, facing in a particular direction, surrounded by particular things, saying, drawing a circle like honey, honey baloney, I say, like Honey the Circle Maker, if you get inside the sacred circle and you do it on this particular day facing in this direction and you perform these hand gestures and you say these words, then God might do something for you or a God might do something for you. And the apostle, not only did the Apostle Paul address this, Moses did too, back in Deuteronomy. We're going to go to both places. Get your, get your, I'll be using the, um, I'll be using the Bible that has for thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory in it. That would be the King James Bible. Galatians chapter four. We use this, uh, that we went to this verse quite a few times when we were dealing with the elements of wrath. Still not done with that series. I am not done with that series. I just kind of took a break from it. We're looking at the Great Seal of the United States of America. Um, Lindsay is editing part three, as we are sprechen. And we'll have it ready for you come on um, Sunday. You know what? I may just upload that Saturday night just for something to do, all right? Uh, But anyway, that's being worked on. But this passage in Galatians chapter four, we dealt with quite a bit. Let me go back to Galatians 3. O foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you, that you should not obey the truth, before whose eyes Jesus Christ had been evidently set forth, crucified among you. This only, now listen to this now. This only what I learn of you, received you the Spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith. What, tell me what actions you performed to get the Spirit going. I, uh, in my years out in Richwoods, Missouri, Pastoring, Richwoods is a very, I mean, it's very country. They are country out there. They farm, they cut wood, they do, some of them cook, a lot of them cook methamphetamine, not in the church. But in rural areas, think of, um, think of Eastern Kentucky or East Tennessee or West Virginia. There are churches in these um, sparsely habitated or inhabited areas where some pretty wacky things going on. Uh, In talking to some of the people out at Richwoods, this goes back years ago, uh, I just sort of got an understanding of how life goes out there. And there's basically some sort of Pentecostal church on just about every holler in and around Richwoods in Washington County. And um, one of my deacons was telling me, he said, he said in one particular church, he, he knew somebody that went and visited there. And he said, I ain't going back over there. 
He said he visited the church. He was invited. He visited the church, and all of a sudden, everybody got up and started running around the church, and I mean inside the church in a circle. And he's just seeing, you know, it's like, it's like a NASCAR thing, just and he's watching, and he's going, what in the world is going on here? And the answer was, he asked somebody, he said, we're racing in the Holy Spirit. Show it to me in the Bible. Show me where you perform and you, and you run around or you do this ritual or you cross yourself or you make hand gestures. Show me that in the Bible where that brings in the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's just sitting there minding his own business. And all of a sudden he sees people running around in the church. Oh, wow. Hey, that's my call. See you guys. And he goes down to that church because they're running around in circles. It's a bunch of nonsense. These people don't believe the Bible. They don't read it. Or they add to it. They think they have a right to. Foolish Galatians get bewitched because the spirit does not come on a person by the works of the law. It does so by the word of God, by the hearing of faith. Faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the word of God. That's how you get the Holy Spirit. You don't go to Benny or Kenny or anybody else and get knocked in the head and all of a sudden, He's, he's imparted to you an electronic or electrical Holy Spirit. That's not how it happens. Paul not only uses that word witchcraft, he references in Galatians 1 another gospel, another gospel. He said, I marvel, verse, chapter 1, verse 6, I marvel that you so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. And I can tell you that there are a lot of groups out there that have perverted the gospel of Jesus Christ. Usually, in fact, almost without fail, by adding a work to it, somehow, some way. The series I did on another Jesus, another spirit, and another gospel, that was the approach I took. Remember the little hot dog stands. And there are people out there, that whether they call themselves charismatics, whether they call themselves um, Episcopalians, whether they call themselves Nazarene, whether they call themselves Baptists, whether they call themselves independent Baptist, fundamental Baptist, free will Baptist. It is irrelevant what the name is. There is a tendency to add works to the favor of God Almighty. It exists. I have... In my past, tried to tell people, you got to do this, got to do that, got to do that. And you know what God did for me? God brought me to a place where he said, now, Mike, show me what, you're, show me what you can do. Show me what you have done to merit my blessing and my grace and my mercy on you. Show me, show me what you've done. And I said, nothing. I haven't done anything. But there was a time in my life when God literally, I've been in church all my life. God literally turned my head into my Bible because I knew if I was ever, ever going to have any hope whatsoever that it was going to be in this book. And I just learned to trust the words that are in this book. And I believe it. I believe every word. And there are people out there who say, well, you have to dress a certain way. You have to walk a certain way. You have to do this a certain way. You can't have this. You have to do this on this particular day. Or you have to, uh, and any number of things that they're going to add to salvation. That is another gospel. That right there is another gospel. Um, and then there are some who say, oh, absolutely. There's only one gospel for today. But in the future, there's actually a second gospel that God is going to give to Israel. And guess what it requires? Works. But though we are an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. A lady, uh, lady talked to me yesterday, and she said that uh, the church that she, her and her husband used to go to they were recommending um, this guy who wrote 90 Minutes in Heaven. He died. He went to heaven. 
He took the grand tour. 90 minutes later, somebody revived him from the dead, and now he's writing for your love gift of $49.95 another gospel. You don't, don't believe that stuff. Don't buy it. Don't buy the book. Don't buy this DVD. Don't buy the message that this man is selling. I don't trust it. I don't trust him. I don't, I don't trust me. I've had dreams before. I have. I've had dreams where it, it seemed to me that this was something from the Lord. I'm not discounting that it was or wasn't. I've written several of them down. I have them in a notebook. One of which, I can see God's work in it. But the other ones, I don't know if they're, I don't know if they're true or not. I, don't, I have no idea. I don't trust. If I told you all the dreams I had, and I've been asked by some people to share these, I'm not doing it. You know why? I don't want to mislead anybody because I don't trust me. But I'm telling you, don't trust this guy. There's something not right about this. He said he died and then he came back. I don't remember his name, but I know it wasn't Lazarus. Is it appointed that a man wants to die and after this the judgment? And here was a rich man in hell who wanted Abraham to send Lazarus back from the dead to tell his family what was on the other side? Do you remember that, Luke chapter 16? And Abraham said, they have Moses and the prophets. The one come back from the dead. They won't believe him. And by the way, Jesus was that one that actually did come back from the dead, and the Jews didn't believe him. Abraham was right. If it's not in the Bible, don't buy it. Don't believe it. So then in Galatians chapter 4, Paul says in verse 9, But now after that ye have known God, or rather are known of God, how turn ye again to the weak and beggarly elements, earth, air, fire, and water? One, two, three, four. Just like Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. Weak and beggarly elements, whereunto ye desire again to be in bondage. Ye observe days, months, times, and years. You have an observance of them. You say that on such and such a day, it's a. This is a. Uh, this is a day that if I if I don't do certain things on this day, then I won't have certain such and such power. What is it about May first? In fact, let's go back to uh, Deuteronomy. In Deuteronomy chapter 18, God said in verse 9, When thou art come into the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee, and thou shalt not, thou shalt not learn to do after the abominations of, these, of those nations. You have to remember, these nations were giants. Giants had a religion. Um, Goliath cursed David by his gods. Go read that. Um, the series I did on the giants, I was, I was amazed. I think that all of this Babylon mystery religion thing that's floating around everywhere all throughout the centuries, I think that originated with the giants. But anyway, God said, when you go into that land, don't learn to do after the abominations of those nations. Notice that don't learn to do. Don't find out their doctrine and don't learn it so that you can try it. Don't do it. A uh, lady told me one time in an email I was talking about this stuff. And I think I've mentioned this several times, but she said at the church she was going to, the pastor's wife, Mrs. Jezebel herself, would take people uh, and, and ha say, we're going to have prayer time. And they would say, now let's face north and west and south and east. Let's face all four of these directions and pray. I promise you, I promise you, had I been there, I would have either A, run out, or B, I would have stood as still as a statue and defied that and then let her come unglued 
because I didn't perform the actions and the works and the do's. I didn't do that. God said, don't learn to do after the abominations of these nations. There shall not be found among you any one that maketh his son or his daughter to pass through the fire, which is interesting because that's part of the Beltane service. Number two, or that useth divination, trying to gain knowledge by a supernatural source. That's what divination is. Or third one out of the chute, an observer of times. Do not observe times. Do not be an observer of, well, it's this day and God only does it on this day and you have to do it on this day and this day and this day. Let me give you, let me give you a 20th and 21st century example of an observer of times, Seventh-day Adventists, and all of, the, all of the people related to that, which David Koresh, David Koresh from the Branch Davidians, See, the Branch Davidian was an offshoot of the Seventh-day Adventist that said, do this, do this, do this while I sleep with your young daughters and your sons. That was going on in there. And I know we want to make the government a, a big enemy over what happened at the Branch Davidian compound, and I am, I'm there. The government overstepped its boundaries by the Constitution in doing what they did at that, at that complex, compound. Will the government do it again? Absolutely. They're doing it at the Bundy Ranch. They're doing it everywhere else. But I am not showing any favor to David Koresh or anybody else. They observed times. They said, you, we can only go to church and worship on Saturday. And if we don't, we're breaking the law. Show me the law. Show me, show me on this, this tables of stone that God wrote himself, front and back so nobody could add to it, in stone so nobody could take away from it. And read the fourth commandment out loud to yourself and ask yourself as you scratch your head, ask yourself this question, where does it say here that I must only go to church on one day a week and cannot go on any other day especially the first day of the week. Where does it say that there? It doesn't. You made it up. Ellen. Something about women named Ellen that just, I don't know. Just not, I don't know. But anyway, Ellen White is the one who came up with that nonsense. She had an extra biblical revelation from God or from an angel that the fourth commandment was exalted high above all the other commandments, and that the fourth commandment was the one commandment that Jesus did not nail to his cross. So therefore, you must perform these. You must do these. God never said you had to worship on Saturday only. He said you had to rest. He didn't say anything about going to church. An observer of times or an enchanter. That is the praise and worship leader who's singing the same lyric over and over and over and over and over again. By the way, the word enchant and the word, uh, the word cantor, C-A-N-T-O-R, um, these are, this is, uh, the, the root of that is music. That's the root of enchanter or someone, an incantation or a cantata. Those of you who know a little bit about music, you know what a cantata is. It's a group of singers. Jesus said, don't do it. Don't do the vain repetitions that the heathen do. Or a witch or a charmer. That also is related. Or a consulter with familiar spirits. That is contemplative prayer. Or a wizard. Or a necromancer. That is Benny Hinn, who feels... Um, the, uh, she, he feels, um, who is it? I believe in miracles. Well, I can't remember her name. Anyway, he, he, he was introduced to the Holy Spirit by her at her gravesite. Todd Bentley's mistress, now wife, said that she had a, she had a dream and Oral Roberts showed up in this dream. He had already died and was prophesying to her. That's a necromancer. Perry Stone, 
Perry Stone did a show where he and his father are talking about this guy that died and they saw this guy in a dream or a vision, and he was saying all kinds of things to them, and they were, they were, oh, hallelujah, praise God, woo, yeah. Now, you can get this particular book that goes with that for only $49. That's necromancy. So are you saying Perry Stone is a witch? He's a necromancer. He claims to have had received knowledge and, and visions of a man that had been dead for years. That's necromancy. Nothing in the Bible. There is nothing in the Bible that tells us, as Bible-believing Christians, that we can expect to see dead people come to us and tell us things. Doesn't exist. Back to Beltane. It's an observance of times. It is, um, let, me, let me kind of do it this way. In, in witchcraft, in paganism, in the newage, in all these other things, they believe that on certain days, these are high holy days. You have the vernal equinox, which is March 21st. It is the day when there's 12 hours in the day and 12 hours in the night. It's all even Stephen there. The next one, these are the, the highest, the four highest. The next one is called the summer solstice. That is the longest day of the year. Um, and then you have the uh, autumnal equinox in autumn. There again, you have the days that are 12 hours in the day, 12 hours in the night. Then you get to the winter solstice, the shortest day of the year. So those are your four quarter days that pagans, witches, everybody else who follows after this stuff believes that there's more power on these days than there is any other, any other day. And God said, don't do that. There is no more power on one day than there is in the other. Now, I agree with what Paul, of course I agree with what Paul said. Paul said it. He was talking about those that regard a day. And there are some, there are some I admit, there are some people who choose to have their worship day on the Sabbath day, on Saturday. I'm all for it. I am all for it. As long as they understand that it is, they are not trying to keep, well, how can I say this? As long as they know that we are saved and blessed by grace alone through faith. But if anybody says, well, God does more things for us on the Sabbath than he does any other day, read, show me that in the scriptures. They're wrong. But if people voluntarily choose to worship God on Saturday as their, as their day, I'm all for it. Um, and Paul said, he that regardeth a day regardeth it unto the Lord, but he that regardeth all days to the Lord, he is regarding all days. I, I, it would, would tickle me to death if we had church six days a week, not seven. Why? Why not seven? Somebody's got to rest here. Anyway, God said don't do this. So we have the, they have the vernal and autumnal equinox. Then we have the opposites of the summer and the winter solster, solstice. Solster. Anyway. And then you have what's called the cross quarter days between the winter solstice, December 21st, and March 21st. About halfway through there is a day called Candlemas. That is February the 2nd, Groundhog Day. That is the 33rd day of the year. Then between the vernal equinox, spring, March 21st, and the summer solstice, you have April 30th slash May 1st as a cross-quarter day in between those two, which is, um, which is Beltane. That's what, that's what this is today. Um, let's see here. You have uh, Samhain between the, vernal, uh, the autumnal equinox, August 21st and December 21st, Samhain, Samhain, it looks looks like Halloween. 
is one of those days. And so on these particular days, you can expect the pagans and the witches and all these other people in the world doing this kind of stuff. Now, here's what I'm going to ask you. What, what do you commonly associate with what they call May Day, May 1st? A lot of people, Kay was telling me about that somebody invited her to a barbecue years ago. Oh, yeah. No, they didn't invite her. I got this wrong. They were talking about they're going to this barbecue and this party on May 1st. Well, yeah, it sound like fun. You, can I go? No, you really wouldn't like it. No, no, I love barbecue. I love having a little fun with people, you know, kind of, you know. No, you can't go. And, and she pressed him and she said, Kate, you don't understand. You won't like it here. And I know we're friends and I know you're a Christian. But there's something you're going to know about me sooner or later. I'm a witch. And I, I'm going to get with my witches and we're going to do witch stuff on witch day. This is what we're going to do. And Beltane, which is what the day is called. By, by the way, what does that name mean? And I was reading different articles about the etymology of Beltane. But you know which one I like? I don't know if anybody else thinks this way. It's got Baal's name in it. Bell. Go look that up in the scripture. It's got Baal's name in it. It's his day. But people associate it with a maypole. Um, I'm going to read some. Here's the Wikipedia article on Beltane. Uh, it's the Gaelic May Day Festival. And here's, let me read this here. Beltane is mentioned in some of the earliest Irish literature, which that's new to me. I didn't know, I didn't know the Irish could write. Just kidding, just kidding. Uh, Irish literature is associated with important events in Irish mythology. It marked the beginning of summer and was when cattle were driven out to the summer pastures. Rituals were performed to protect the cattle, crops, and people and to encourage growth. Listen to this one now. God specifically mentioned this in Deuteronomy 18. Don't make your children pass through the fire. So um, special bonfires were kindled. Think of, think of a place in the Bible that is a place of burning. Think about that when, when you think of these bonfires. Um, special bonfires were kindled. Their flames, smoke, and ashes were deemed to have protective powers. Think Revelation 9. And the key opens the door and what comes out of it. The smoke of a great furnace comes out of there. And things start rising up out of the ashes. Think about that. Smoke and ashes were deemed to have protective powers. The people and their cattle would walk around the bonfire, get the circle, or between two bonfires. Now they're passing through the fire. Exactly what God said don't do. So they're passing between the fires and sometimes leap over the flames or embers. All household fires would be doused and then relit from the Beltane bonfire. Now that concept reaches out uh, and is associated with other ideas. The U.S. Capitol building, you know, with that big dome, is actually modeled after the temple of the goddess Vesta, V-E-S-T-A. Have you ever heard of a vestibule? Um, the Vesta was the goddess of the fireplace. Because, here we go, watch this now. Because usually the fireplace was in the center of the home back then. So that it could heat and radiate out the entire home. And so Vesta was the goddess of the hearth or the fireplace. And there's something about some kind of secret that's in that fire. Think about that. That's what the Capitol building was designed after. But anyway, they, they worship this sacred fire. It's sort of like the Native Americans or the First Nations up in Canada. They cleanse themselves with what? You ever seen them do this cleansing ritual? They got the fire going. They get over there by the fire and they take that hand and put it in the smoke and go. They're cleaning their body with soot. It doesn't make any sense to me. That's not clean. 
But that's what they do. They worship this fire. It's a sacred fire. It's a holy fire. Um, which I think is a, a, a symbol of hell fire. So they, they light the Beltane fires. They put out the old flame in their, in their uh, fireplaces, and they relight it with this Beltane fire. That's, you know what? Read James about the tongue and how it sets the whole world on fire. Doors, windows, beers, and cattle themselves would be decorated with yellow mayflowers, perhaps because they evoked fire. Think of, a, think of how a flower would look like a flame. Now watch this. Here we, here we go. Here we go. In parts of Ireland, people would make a may bush. Now I'm going to show you a picture of what a may bush is. All right? Take a look at that. Isn't that pretty? It's gorgeous. Right now, all of the flowering trees in the state of Missouri are just, they're almost in full blossom. It's absolutely amazing. To look at this, you would look at that and say, man, that's pretty. Wow, that is absolutely, oh, I just love that. That's the maybush. What you may not comprehend, you would never probably see it from just looking at it from this angle. But that may bush, the flowers and the leaves on that may bush are concealing something. They're concealing the fact that that bush is loaded with thorns. You would never know it. See, the flowers, the beauty of it on the outside conceals the sting that's on the inside. Let's let's go to Sola Scriptura. Let's go to the King James Bible. Here's what we're going to do. Let's just do a little study. This and, and and I could have already done this. I could have already Hoggard, you want you to print that stuff out and you can read it quicker. Cuz I'm going to teach you how to do it yourself. Give a man a fish and he will eat for a day. Teach a man to fish, and he will never want to go back to work a day in his life. So I'm going to teach you how to fish, all right, and teach you how to search the scriptures. Type in the word thorn and put the asterisk after that because that gives you everything thorn plus whatever ending you might have, like thorns, thorny, th thorningly, okay, thornly. I just made that up. Uh, Genesis 3.18, here we go. This is the curse of what? The curse of sin. God said unto Adam, he said, Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, and hast eaten of the tree of which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for thy sake. In sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. Thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth to thee, and thou shalt eat the herb of the field. In the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread till thou return unto the ground. It's the picture of the curse of sin. Numbers 33, 55, God told the Israelites, when you go into that land, run them all out, kill them. But he says in verse 55, but if you will not drive out the inhabitants of the land from before you, then it shall come to pass that, that those which you let remain of them shall be pricks in your eyes and thorns in your sides. Think of someone who had thorns sticking down in their eyes in the Bible. We get there. Thorns in your sides and shall vex you in the land wherein you dwell. The inhabitants, those giants that were there, God said they're going to be thorns in your sides. It's the curse of disobedience to God. Joshua 23, 13, the same thing. But they shall be snares and traps unto you and scourges in your sides and thorns in your eyes. This is, whenever you see something symbolically, like with a thorn or a rose, the rose conceals the thorn. That's why the rose is a powerful image in the occult. It conceals the thorn. And so we're learning what the thorn is. When you are studying uh, things related to Freemasonry and you hear that um, Hiram Abiff 
is the secret master who holds the keys to understanding how to build a temple, which is the human body. And that Hiram Abiff has been slain with a deadly wound in his head, but and he is covered up. His grave is marked by acacia. You know what that is? Shittim. Thorns. In fact, let me do this. I think I have a remembrance of something here. S H I T T I M. 32 times in the King James Bible. There's another variant to this, I think, isn't there? No? All right. Anyway, that's what that is. That's what acacia is. Thorns. Thorn asterisk. There we go. Back back to the ranch here. Um, thorns in your eyes. So when you're studying something and you come across acacia, you come across uh, things like that, or you see thorns somewhere, these tattoos that people are getting all over the place, what are they? They're getting thorn tattoos. They literally have thorns drawn into their... Where do you? What spirit do you think gives them the idea, yeah, I want thorns on my arm right there, man. What spirit do you think is, is, is part of that? Let's go to... Oh, let's see here. Da, 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 da. Thorns and snares are in the way of the froward. But uh, he that doth keep his soul shall be far from them. Here is Proverbs 24, 31, or 30. I went by the field of the slothful and by the vineyard of the man void of understanding. And lo, it was all grown over with thorns and nettles had covered the face thereof and the stone wall was thereof was broken down. That's what happens when you start letting sin back into your life, controlling you. You think, oh, it's just a little bitty one. It's okay. It's just like, just like what Jesus taught in that parable. We'll get, we'll get to that in a minute. In fact, let's go there. Let's go to that parable. Uh, let's see. We have it in Matthew. Some fell among thorns, and the thorns sprung up and choked them. He tells you the meaning of it. He also that receives seed among the thorns is he that heareth the word, and the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word, and he becometh unfruitful. Down in Mark... He, uh, he says it like this, those that uh, which are sown among thorns, such as hear the word and the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches. And here we go. The lusts of other things. What do we lust after? Money, power, esteem, prestige, houses, women, men. Those are the things we lust after, the things that our eyes look upon and we go, oh, I want that. That's covetousness. And the lust of the flesh where we desire things that God said, no, you can't do that. And we have those thorns in us. And here is the, here is the seed of the word of God going into somebody's life and they 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 like it they say yeah I'll, I'll be a christian but the thorns choke out the word is it let me let me, i'll just run this by you is it a is it is a is it a mark that someone is unsaved because they have a thorn no well how can you say that pastor paul did Paul had a thorn in his flesh, a messenger of Satan to buffet him. And he asked God three times. Why three times? Lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life. Three times did I, I besought the Lord to remove it. And God said, my grace is sufficient for you. I love grace. I do. But here's what happens. You start letting thorns. You know what thorns will do? with every word of God that has been spoken to you, thorns will choke it out so it doesn't bear fruit. That's the mark of a true believer, by the way. They bear fruit. Go read John 15. Um, so what did they do to Jesus? He is the one who took our sins from us. 
What image do we get of that? He has a crown of thorns. They plaited it. You know what that means? They braided it together like DNA. And they put that on his head. A crown. That means it. he's, he's representing the king of sin. The man of sin. The son of perdition. That's who he is making a show of openly on the cross. And so what happened when they, when they wove the crown of thorns and put it on his head? What happened? He died. He killed sin. He took the handwriting of ordinances that was against us and nailed them to his cross, including the fourth commandment. He nailed them to his cross. I love that. I, I did a uh, I did a Watchman video called uh, something of the Crown of Thorns and the Antichrist or something like that few, several years ago. Um, it's if you haven't seen it, go watch it. All right, and not because it's me, and not because for every view I get more. It has nothing to do with that. It'll bless you. It'll help you understand what was done for you. Jesus killed. The power of your sin on his cross, if you believe that. Um, look at this, Luke 6, 44. For every tree is known by, by his own fruit. For of thorns, men do not gather figs. Did you catch that? Thorn trees do not produce figs. Fruit. I love figs. Bramble bushes. You do not gather grapes from bramble bushes. Now watch this. Let's go down to the book of Hebrews. There's a lot of controversy over Hebrews chapter 6. I think I get it. I think I get Hebrews 6. Because it says in verse 4, For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift, and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost, and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the world to come. I think there's five things there. Count that again. If they shall fall away, same phrase, fall away. Look at things that fall in the Bible. Go to the plain of Dura and see them falling away. Second Thessalonians 2, there's a falling away first. If they shall fall away to renew them again under repentance, seeing they crucified themselves, the Son of God afresh, and put him to an open shame. Now, this verse, oh, went, I did the wrong thing here. This passage is argued over um, immensely. I think it's better, rather than to argue over a passage, why don't we just all believe the passage and believe and, and understand that there are things that it says and things that it doesn't say. And I find it interesting that in Hebrews 6, it never says that it is impossible. Let's see. For Let's see. Where am I? Hebrews 6. Here we go. I'll get back here. For it is impossible for those who were, it mentions enlightened, tasted the gift, made partakers of the Holy Ghost, tasted the good word of God, and the powers of the world to come. It's interesting to me that it doesn't actually mention that they were saved. Because I, I, I've, I've read the scriptures on this issue. I looked and, and looked at every place in my, using this, soft, this software right here. Every place in the Bible where it said save salvation, savior, every, save being, whatever. Looking at how salvation is used, how the word is applied in the scripture. And I, the conclusion I drew from looking at the whole counsel of God is it can't be called salvation if it didn't actually save them. I don't see any place in the Bible where God saved somebody, but it didn't work. I don't see that. And it doesn't mention that here. It does, however, coincide with the parable that we just looked at. 
because there are four groups in that parable. Three of them die and go to hell. How do I know that? They didn't bear any fruit. And that's what Jesus said. If it doesn't bear fruit, cut it down, cast it in the fire. That's what the husbandman does. But the, the wayside people, they don't bear any fruit because the devil came and ate the word up as soon as it was there. The stony ground people, they don't bear any fruit either because they went to church. They went to a revival meeting. They went down to the altar. They said, yeah, I, I think I want to go to heaven. I want Jesus to be my Savior. You believe John 3, 16? Absolutely. So they, they, they get up thinking, okay, this is it. And then the preacher preaches something right from the Bible, and they go, that's stupid. I don't believe that. That's a bunch of baloney. I ain't buying that for a second. Well, you know, that's the word of God. Yeah, but men wrote that, wrote that stuff. That, that, was, that was back then. I don't believe that stuff. That's stony ground. Pfft, gone. That is, they tasted the good word of God. They were, had, had the enlightenment, a limited enlightenment, of their sin. They believe like one verse, but they wouldn't let it go any further than that. You start dealing with issues in people's lives from the Bible about how we're to live and how we're to, how we're to be in our marriages. Women, women who will not regard their place in the home and in the family and in the church. Men, likewise, who will not do what they're commanded to do by God, that is love their wife unconditionally. They're going to believe parts of the Bible. They're going to believe all of it. Stony ground. Then we have the thorny ground people. And if you, and if you look, at, look at the whole of Hebrews 6, if they shall fall away to renew them again unto repentance, seeing they crucified themselves, the Son of God afresh, and put it to an open chain. For the earth which drinketh in the rain that cometh oft upon it, and bringeth forth herbs, meet for them by whom it is dressed, receiveth blessing from God. But that which beareth thorns and briars is rejected and is nigh unto cursing. You see the two words, blessing and cursing, in that passage? If it bears fruit, it's blessed, because God blessed it and said, be what? Fruitful and multiply. The blessing of God is, and blessing is the salvation word. You're blessed, you are going to go to heaven. But if you're cursed, it's because the thorns came in and choked out the word that you tasted. That's what I see here. To me, it, it just makes sense. Anyway, that's what thorns represent. Um, so let me go back to this thing. Here's, here's the, here is the May Day hedgerow. Does that ring a bell with any of you former headbangers out there? The, the epitome of what rock and roll music is all about. It's a song done by Led Zeppelin called Stairway to Heaven. Everybody who knows rock and roll knows Stairway to Heaven. Young, young boys who pick up a guitar for the first time, what's the first song they want to learn? Smoke on the Water and then Stairway to Heaven. Stairway to Heaven... Uh, you can go read this. Uh, Jimmy Page, Robert Plant, those are the two guys, I think, responsible for this. can't remember which one it was. It was Page or Plant that moved into Aleister Crowley's house, the Bolskine house. Moved into it. Why? Because Crowley had built it to be aligned in a certain way so that his most darkest ceremonial witchcraft could be performed by observing signs and seasons and times and directions. And he basically said that it was he was trying to write the lyrics down to this song. He just, all of a sudden, his, his hand went up, pencil in hand, and his hand started writing these words. If there's a bustle in your hedgerow, don't be alarmed now. It's just the spring clean for... The May Queen. What is the May Queen? But anyway, you get the idea here that at Beltane, they decorate these 
flowering bushes, the may bushes, and the may bushes conceal the thorn. There's there's a thorn in there. Think of the uh, the ec- the exorcist, Damien Thorn. See these young ladies here? They represent the May Queen. The May Queen is the fertility goddess. The May Queen is Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots. Think about it. I, I have never, I never in all the years of public school, we never went outside on May 1st to dance around a maypole. But I am hearing, that was, of course, that would be the 70s. I am hearing now that parents are finding out that their children on May 1st set up a gigantic tower, a pole, and danced around it. But they won't let your child wear a T-shirt with John 3.16 on it. Wait, we have to keep religion separate now from our schools. The May Queen is performing a ritual. And these ribbons being twirled around the maypole. Watch this now. Remember what the fasces looks like. The bundle of sticks that have been bound together with the axe head coming out of it. You have the same concept here. You have the maypole, which is a represent. It's, it's Baal's shaft, an obelisk. That's what it's called, obelisk. And it's got the name of Baal in it, Bell. Um, so does Beltane. So the maypole is essentially an image of the procreative part of Baal. And the May Queens are concealing it by wrapping it up in something in a spiral fashion. By the way, when they do the Maypole dance, what geometric shape are they making? Are they making a square? Are they making a polyhedron, a decahedron? Are they making an octagon? They're making a circle. Just like Honey the Phony dancing in his circle, drawing in his circle so that you can, uh, on this particular day, if you draw the circle and do the ritual, then the cows are going to have more cattle and the corn is going to produce better and mama's going to have another baby. Hang on to this one. Do, Do the math on it. If May 1st is a fertility ritual, I'm just going to stop right there. When would the baby be born? Probably on February the 2nd. That would be nine months later. Okay? Just thought I'd throw that in. Anyway, that's what they're doing. And it dawned on me years ago. I put this in the Babel Conspiracy video in the book that I did. It dawned on me that those ribbons looked an awful lot like the DNA strands. And think about about what we have. We have this thorn in us. We have this no good thing in our flesh. It literally is in our DNA. And it's concealed there, just like the thorns in in the may bush. It's concealed. It's hidden there. It's been occulted there. Um, this tower represents what's called, I'm going to give you a word and you can research this a little bit. It's called the axis mundi, the sacred axis or the center of the earth, the Yggdrasil. Um, it seems like that was mentioned in a movie. What movie was that? Was that Captain America or something like that? But it's the axis mundi, the center of the earth. There's usually this concept 
that a tree or a pole or a tower of some kind represents, where's my notes here, represents what the entire rest of the world and the universe revolves around. The axis mundi is, is uh, here, in fact, here, do this. Think of the 12 tribes of Israel camping in the wilderness and what's in the middle of them. The tabernacle, the temple, and the, the, uh, the pillar of cloud, the glory of God resting upon the mercy seat in the, in the most holy place. All right? So think about that. See, think about God being the center of his people. Think about what Jesus said. Uh, where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I where? In the midst of them. So then take that and, uh, and apply the opposite of it. Then you kind of understand what the axis mundi or this, this pole represents. It represents the fact that instead of, Instead of uh, people gathering together to worship God and having God in their midst, they want this sacred divine uh, tree, which is an acacia tree, a thorn tree. They want that to rise up from among them. The Kabbalah tree of life is an axis mundi, the Tower of Babel. In fact, take your Bible, turn to Genesis 11. The Tower of Babel was an axis mundi. It represented the sacred center point. Think about that. The cross point. That's what it represents. It's, a, it's an image or a figure of, of the Antichrist. Let me uh, go back here. So this Baal's shaft here, this tower, this pole, um, what was, what was I studying in the Bible the other day? I was studying towers, and I was studying pillars. That's what I'm trying to think of. When God sent the Israelites into the promised land, you know what he told them to break in pieces? All the pillars that they saw around town. Guess what they were? They were obelisks, Baal's shaft. They were maypoles. They were the divine tree. They were the missing piece that Isis had to generate on her own. That's what they represent. Now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you something here. It's going to upset some people. I can't help it. Um, you understand that a stone image like this pole or a tower or something like that representing the center of the, of the earth, the axis mundi, um, you can type this in, access money, you do it at Wikipedia, read the article about it. You'll kind of get the understanding that it's, that it's an occult symbol. And, but it basically represents the beast, the Antichrist. And here we, here we, have, the op, we have the opposites here. We have Christ who is the center of his church. He's in the midst of his people, the tabernacle being in the midst of the 12 tribes. Think of the, uh, think of the, um, the, the Maseroth mentioned in the scripture, think of the 12 months of the year, and every month you have a new set of stars. And God told Israel that they would be as the stars that were in, that were in the heavens. Isn't that neat? Here you have 12 tribes, you have 12 months, and every month you have a new set of stars, and they all rotate around the presence of God. I love that. That's beautiful. So, Think of Christ and think of Antichrist. What are some of the symbols for the Antichrist? Let me show you here. Hang on here. Let me show you one of the symbols for the Antichrist. Where is it? Where is it? Where is it? Here. What can I do? Like right there. That's one of the symbols for the Antichrist. Are you with me? Charles Taze Russell. You know who he was? Charles Taze Russell was the founder of the Jehovah's Witness cult. Charles Taze Russell wrote a book called The Divine Plan of the Ages. God's Plan for the Ages. 
Brady was very familiar with this book. I asked Brady about it, and he said, yep, that was Taze Russell. Taze Russell in the divine, God's divine plan for the ages, Charles Taze Russell put forth the idea. Brady called, Brady was talking to me one time about what they call progressive revelation. The idea that God has a new truth for certain at certain times. That's one of the mainstays of the Jehovah's Witness. That's what gave them credence. Here's Charles Taze Russell. He belongs to a, a church, and he doesn't like what they're saying about hell. So he decides that he's going to change that and alter that. And in order to do that, he's got to convince the people that are listening to him that that although that might have been true way back then, it is no longer true now. So Taze Russell developed this idea that God had this different revelation or this different truth for the time that he was in now that was totally different from these ages past. You already get a copy. You can go to books.google.com and get a copy of Charles Taze Russell's book, The Divine Plan of the Ages, and you'll see it in there. And he, he issued this book, The Divine Plan of the Ages. Then he got a hold of some information about the Great Pyramid of Egypt. And Charles Taze Russell was so fascinated by this book or by these concepts of the Great Pyramid that Taze Russell um, republished his book, The Divine Plan of the Ages, and he featured the, the Great Pyramid as sort of the focal point of his, of his new doctrine, and he said that, that God and God's people, uh, there were several different theories. One said that Methuselah built the Great Pyramid. One theory says that Enoch built it. Um, different ones floating around. All these, there were several scholars in the 1800s that were trying to put forth this idea that the Great Pyramid was actually the altar mentioned and the pillar mentioned in Isaiah chapter 19 in the, in the land of Egypt? I don't think so. I don't think so. Not on your life. But that's what, that's what was going around in the 1800s. Taze Russell picked up on this and wrote a new chapter in his book, The Divine Plan of the Ages, where he focused on what he saw as divine proof of his progressive revelation theory. That in, in back in Bible times, yes, they taught about hell. And so every place in the Bible now that you see mentioning hell like being on fire and it's all this bad thing and you're there forever suffering, all of those things you see in the Bible, they don't apply anymore. Not in this time frame. See the word ages here? Not in this age. And he, he drew a chart in here. This is from the divine plan of the ages. And he mentions the pyramid as being the axis mundi, the center of the earth. By the way, Taze Russell believed in this so much that at his graveside, he ordered, if I remember this right, he ordered that after they bury him, he actually drew the design out that they put a pyramid at the end of his gravesite as a memorial to his doctrine. And you just go to Google Images and type in Charles Taze Russell Pyramid, and you'll find a picture of it. Taze Russell was, he believed that the proof of his theory was seen in the Great Pyramid. And he referred to it as the Axis Mundi, the divine center, the center of the earth. 
if you get a copy of the Divine Plan of the Ages, as shown in the Great Pyramid, from it's a free download. It's one of those books that have it's old books expired to copyright, but you can get a PDF of it. You'll find charts in there that show that the Great Pyramid is that the it actually says um, at the same time the uh, the Great Pyramid in the center is what this says. And here's the map here. He actually got it from another source, but he included it in his book that the Great Pyramid is the Axis Mundi. This was written in the 1880s. This is what Clarence Larkin published in 1920. Same idea. Same concept. The Axis Mundi is also seen represented by Jacob's Ladder. This is, this is, we're still dealing with the Maypole and what it represents. The Axis Mundi, let me, let me go back to this here. The Axis Mundi is the connection between earth and heaven. And the whole concept of a pyramid is that this connection between man and God or earth and heaven is done in progressions, levels. You see what I'm saying here? Go ask Freemasons what they believe in. Why do they have 33 degrees? Why do they have 13 degrees in the York Rite? Why do they have 90 degrees in the Memphis Mizraim ritual of Freemasonry? Can you just show up to the lodge and say, I want to be a Mason. Give me my 32, 33 pin. No. You've got to go through the Blue Lodge. You've got to go through the degrees. You have to perform the rituals. You have to have, watch this now. Freemasonry actually teaches that there is a high-level secret at the top that those down here would never know until they walk the steps of the pyramid. And as they get higher and higher and higher by levels and rituals and initiations, then the true secret of the plan, the great work, can be revealed to them. That's where Taze Russell got it from. Let me contrast that with Bible Christianity. Bible Christianity says you go before God and ask God to save you, and he saves you. You don't progress in Christianity to become more saved. You don't progress in Christianity to get to a higher level than others. That's not scriptural. Jesus told the parable about the guy paying the people working in his field. They all got paid the same. I've been with people on their deathbed, confessing Jesus as their Savior shortly before their death. Why would, why would that? And I'm asking a, a rhetorical question, but the answer is there is no scriptural answer. Or there is, there is not the answer that some people say there is. One woman in particular, dying of cancer, and I went to her. She was my neighbor. I grew up around here in her neighborhood, knew her, knew her all my life. And I said, I'm not really good at this, but I have an obligation. And I said, I'm going to be dead right honest with you. You're about to die. You need to know where you're going. Brady and Bradley's dad, Keith, they called me to the ER. He was having a lot of, he was having a lot of chest pains. He was having trouble breathing. So I went to the ER, visited with them, and they were afraid that he had cancer. And so they finally checked him into a room. They were going to keep him overnight. They did all the chest x-rays and the CT scans and everything like that. 
And when we got to the room, I told Brady and Bradley, I said, once you guys split, go get lunch. Let me talk to your dad alone. And they, they agreed that was a, probably the best idea. And I went in that room, that hospital room alone with Keith. And I said, Keith, I'm going to be dead honest with you. I'm not going to play games with you. I like you. I love you. And I love them boys. But Keith, it sounds to me like you're pretty sick and we don't know what's going on, but you may not live very long. And I said, Keith, if you died today, where would you go? He said, I'd go to hell. I said, God can change that for you. And that man got saved in that hospital room just a few months before he died. In fact, right when we got done praying, he was wiping tears from his eyes. And I said, Keith, are you saved? He said, yeah, I know it too. Right when he said that, the doctor came in and told him he had cancer. I've been in church almost all of my life. Preached thousands of sermons. Straight Sunday school attendance. I go to the house of God. I read the Bible. I make DVDs. I do this. I do that. I don't think for a second that I get anything different than Keith Crum. And I wouldn't accept it if I did. It's not biblical. But that's where that came from. The worship of this, of this progressive revelation connection between earth and heaven. Let me show you this graphic here, what it, what it really is. Jacob's ladder is said to be the ladder that connects earth with heaven. Here's a rendition of it here. It's DNA, people. Go back to the, go back to the maypole. You're dealing with the same thing. You're dealing with the axis mundi, the ladder that will take you to heaven, that will, that will elevate you so that you can be a god. That's what that axis mundi is. Here's another representation of it. In fact, let's do this. Here we have the pyramid. We have the levels. There's 13 here, 72 stones, and Horus, the capstone. Just read the King James Bible. He's, Jesus is not the capstone. He is the foundation cornerstone, head of the corner of the foundation. He is not the capstone of a pyramid. That is not what your King James Bible says. You know who says that? The NIV translates it capstone. Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ being the chief capstone. That's what years ago convinced me that the NIV was something other than the Holy Bible. Because I knew what that was. And I knew it wasn't God. And they said that Jesus is that all-seeing eye there, the capstone. And I went, that's an abomination. By the way, so does Larkin. Larkin actually retranslates the King James Bible for you because it's not good enough for him. And he retranslates it by telling you that Jesus Christ is actually the capstone, what should be on the top of the unfinished pyramid. Doesn't that, doesn't that cause any alarm to go off? Down at the bottom, you have a date. 1776. Is that, that should ring a bell, shouldn't it? The Freedom Tower. Oh, by the way, look at this. It's a pyramid. It's actually, here we go. You ready? The, the Freedom Tower, which is what they built in place of the two World Trade Towers. You can see part of the, the old footprint right here. A new one rising up in its place. The Freedom Tower is two pyramids interlocked and connected with each other. Here's if you if you count the sides, you have one, two, three, four, and then on the other side you have five, six, seven, and eight. You have eight parts here where you have these this pyramid and its four sides pointing up. 
and this pyramid and its four sides pointing down. By the way, I have a graphic. Uh, I don't know if I could find it. I have a graphic of one of the meeting brochures of the um, uh, Jehovah's Witness. They were meeting after Charles Taze Russell died to approve um, the design for the pyramid that was going to be on his, on his tomb at his gravesite. And on the front of this particular booklet, they have two pyramids, one from here, one from heaven, one from the earth, touching one another in the center point. That's what the Freedom Tower is. It's a representation of that. This is an axis mundi. This is the center of the earth where earth connects with heaven and it's exactly 1,776 feet tall, exactly. So what is that based on? Well, they say, you know, that's the formation of the United States of America. There was something else that happened. You know who this guy is? Adam Weishaupt. He's a German. He was a Actually, he could have been Pope because he's a Jesuit. He was a Jesuit priest who, some say he left the Catholic Church, left the Jesuit order. I say maybe on the outside he did. You know how some people say, once saved, always saved? When you're in the Illuminati, you're once a Jesuit, always a Jesuit. Unless you're Alberto Rivera. Uh, do the math on May 1st. May 1st is the 121st day of the year. That's 11 times 11. Let's, let's take that concept. Let's go back to the story of a tower. Genesis chapter 11. The whole earth was of one language and of one speech, and it came to pass as they journeyed from the east that they found a plain in the land of Shinar, and they dwelt there. And they said one to another, Go to, let us make brick, and burn them throughly. Who is it that builds with bricks? Masons do, don't they? In fact, you read some Masonic literature, they'll tell you. Masonry can trace its, uh, its, um, its order and its origins all the way back to the Tower of Babel. They had brick for stone and slime for mortar. And, and some of the Masonic authors will tell you that the, the, the ability to speak in symbols actually goes back to the Tower of Babel because when the languages were confused, they didn't have any other way of communicating thoughts and ideas between them because they hadn't had sufficient time to learn the language. So what they did was they spoke in symbols. Okay, You saw a guy walking around uh, uh, the city of Babylon going like this, and you go, I spreck in that Deutsch right there. Go to let us make brick and burn them throughly. And they had brick for stone and slime they had for mortar. And they said, go to let us build us a city and a tower whose top may reach unto heaven. You see it? You see that? This is your axis mundi right here. They believed that a physical tower represented Earth's connection with heaven. That's what they believe. Now, here's what we're going to do. Let's find whether our Bible says anything about that or not. So let's go here. Let's sweep that with the besom of destruction. Let's type in the word tower, asterisk. We get all the words in here 65 times in the King James Bible. Let us build us a city and a tower whose top may reach into heaven. What does this tower represent? Let's go down to, I just saw this earlier. You have the Tower of um, in, in the tower of Shechem. Very interesting story. Go read that. Go study towers. Here we go. 2 Samuel 22, 3. Listen to this. Let's look at verse 2. And he said, The Lord is my rock, my fortress, and my deliverer. The God of my rock, and him will I trust. He is my shield and the horn of my salvation, my high tower, my refuge, my Savior. Thou savest me from violence. And if you'll read the scriptures, uh, let's go to the book of Psalms. I think I remember some passages in Psalms. Here we go. Psalm 18, 2. 
the horn of my salvation, my high, my high tower. Uh, Psalm 61, 3, for thou hast been a shelter for me and a strong tower from the enemy. Psalm 144, 2, my goodness and my fortress, my high tower, my deliverer. Proverbs 18, 10, the name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous runneth into it and is safe. Somebody say amen. So now the Lord literally is our tower. So should we build an obelisk or a maypole or a pyramid or some sort of tower because that's what God said he was? No, 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 no. God does not dwell in temples made with hands. So this stone tower that they built in Babel, a ziggurat. A ziggurat is basically a circular form of a pyramid because it's big at the bottom and ascends and and narrows at the top. And it's all about ascension into heaven in levels. The 121st day of the year, 11 times 11, that number 11, you know what it's a reference to? You have the 10 horns in the book of Daniel and then one coming out of them. He's the 11th horn. Think about it. Think about Genesis 11. Think about what 11 represents. Confusion, chaos, disorder, ab, uh, ordo ab chao. Order comes out of chaos, comes out of the confusion. That's what the Tower of Babel represents. And so the maypole is, a, is an emblem of the Antichrist. And it's hidden inside of your DNA. And that's what they're doing around there. Let's look at some things that happened on May 1st. In This is Today in History. Let's look at some things that happened on May 1st. We already mentioned Adam Weishaupt. Adam Weishaupt, whether a Jesuit or not a Jesuit, I think he was. I think he was just following orders. Um, formed a group that was called the Illuminati, but its actual title was the Order of Perfectibilists. What does that mean? Um, Adam Weishaupt and his order believed in the idea that man was evolving. Man was going in steps. Are you catching this? Man was going in steps. He was getting higher and higher. He was evolving. And the order of the Illuminati, the order of perfectibilists, believed that man was on the precipice, on the verge of taking that last final step to where man would be perfect. He would be a god. He would never die. That's what Weishaupt believed in. Um, You can just sort of scrape aside all these internet posts and YouTube videos and people saying, ah, George Bush and the Illuminati. So was Richard Nixon. So was the Queen Elizabeth. And they got together and they had rituals together and they molested children and did all this stuff. You don't know if that stuff's true. You have no idea that that stuff's true. But here's what you can know. You can know that there actually was historically a secret society formed for one reason. That was to bring people into an an illumination where their eyes would be open and they would be as gods knowing good and evil. That's what the Illuminati was all about. And it was formed on May 1st. 1776, the 121st day of the year, 11 times 11. Here's something else. I, some of this I just found out today. You know what that is? That's the Empire State Building. A tower who's at the time the tallest building in the world at that time much less New York City. When the World Trade Centers fell on September 11th, um, I was watching Fox News, and one of the commentators said 
The Empire State Building has now once again become the tallest building in New York City. And the um, Empire State Building was dedicated May 1st, 1931. May 1st. I don't have my, where's my music? My iPad was dead. That's why I don't have my dun, dun, dun. May 1st. So you get this idea. This tower whose top may reach into heaven was dedicated on the 121st day of the year, 11 times 11. Here's something else you, I didn't know until two hours ago. The very first humanist manifesto was printed May 1st, 1933. Dun, dun, dun! You know what? I've been charging this. We just we just got to have the Illuminati music. All right? So hang on here. Let me do this. I'll plug it in. We'll get the Illuminati music going. We just got to have it. Hang on here. Let me do that, and I'll do that. Here we go. All right, ready? The Illuminati music. What happened to it? Where's my Illuminati music? Are we on? Yeah, here we go. I don't know what's going on here. It won't work. Hmm. That makes me sad. Anyway, Humanist Manifesto. You know what the Humanist Manifesto is all about? You are God. Religion has destroyed this world. We want to eliminate religion on the world. We want a new order of humanism where humans, and, they, and humanism is strong evolution. Because humanism believes that, that humans are achieving their own deity status, their own godhead through levels. That's what evolution is. It's levels. I'm just going to ask you, do you believe in levels of salvation? Because if you do, mm -mm. I got some words that I want to say, but I'm I'm just going to show me the Bible. Show me, show me in the scripture where you are above some other people as far as your relationship to God. You're either saved by grace or not, and that grace is always unmerited grace. And if you think that you've merited more favor than other people, you're wrong. I, people will, will call here or they will talk to me or they will send an email. Pastor, will you pray for me? I sure will. I sure will. And I'm honored by that. I'm blessed by that. And if I see the email and I read it, I usually stop right then and pray for them and for their needs. Um, and and I, I, I don't want to dissuade people from doing this because I, I love the connection and the fellowship that, that we have when you ask me to pray for you. But I want to tell you that if, if you think that God's going to hear me first over you because you think I'm some, oh, I'm, oh, I'm so close to God, I will tell you very kindly and lovingly that you are you're incorrect. If you have children, you love all your children. Now you may love them in a slightly different way and for different reasons. There's certain things you love about them. But as far as what you're willing to do, you love your children all the same. And that's how God sees us. He hath concluded all under sin. So, I, I mean, I, I'm not any better than anybody else. May 1st, 1933, Humanist Manifesto. George Bush decides to go out to the USS Abraham Lincoln, whose, uh, whose number, whose Navy number is 72. Check it out, okay? That's going to be on an upcoming Watchman. He decides to go, and it just, it just, it stunned me. 
Because, I, you know, you hear on the news, here's here's GW. He's flying uh, one of these F-15 fighters, going to land on a carrier. F-15. I don't know. I don't know what it was. He go lands out on this aircraft carrier, the USS Abraham Lincoln. Naval designation 72. And he has to, on May 1st, tell everybody that they won the war in Iraq. No, they didn't. And everybody knows it. We went fighting it for four more years, five more years. Still fighting it. Had to be on May 1st for him to announce this. You remember who this woman is? She's the D.C. madam. She is the woman in Washington, D.C. that had a little black book with lots and lots of very powerful people's names in it. She ran an escort service in Washington, D.C., and if you, if you think that all of our politicians up there are just good guys, faithful to their wives, good family men, you're wrong. The extent of immorality that exists in, in centers of political power is staggering. And, it's, and if, if, just think about this. If you are a visiting businessman, lobbying a member of Congress, or you are an incoming um, uh, head of state or something like that, or something, you you have some sort of influence somewhere, you go to Washington, D.C., I guarantee you somebody, in order to curry favor with you, is going to hook you up. And that's what her job was. She was the hookup lady. Did she know a lot? I believe she did. And there must have been something that she wasn't going to play along with because now all of a sudden the feds have her arrested. They're going to throw the book at her. And she lets them know. She lets everybody know that if they go through with this, prosecuting her and convicting her, she's going to start spilling the beans Names are going to be named. She was, I don't care much for Alex Jones, but she was on Alex Jones' show before her guilty verdict came down. And he asked her specifically, got any plans on killing yourself anytime soon? She said, absolutely not. I'm going to fight this until the very end. So on May 1st, There she was hanging with one sleeve rolled up and one sleeve rolled down. Boy, I wish my music would work. Where's my music? Come on. Come on now. Here we go. Let's try this again. Ah, I don't know what's wrong here. Won't work. Anyway, then you remember this one? May 1st, 2011, eight years after mission accomplished. It had to be on May 1st. We've killed Osama bin Laden. I killed Osama bin Laden. Barehanded. Yep, that was all me. That's what I did. So, usually on certain days of the year, February the 2nd, May 1st, October 31st, June 21st, I'm not losing any sleep over things, but I'm always curious as to what is going to happen on days like that. I'm always curious because when you work for the devil, you perform rituals. That's what you do because the devil, I mean, I mentioned Aleister Crowley and his bullskin house. If you go do a little study on that, you can clearly see and understand that, that Aleister Crowley bought this particular land and built this house in a certain way so that there was a room that was facing this direction and it had this in it and it had this in it because Crowley was going to 
was going to attempt some of his most very dark, evil rituals at this house. Because there were devils that the only way he could get in contact with them was through these certain rituals. And believe it or not, here's what really bothers me. Is the fact that people believe that God is that way. And he's not. God doesn't require you facing a direction, you doing it on a certain day. He doesn't require a certain amount of money. He doesn't require a certain amount of people to pray all at one time, at the same time. He doesn't require that. He doesn't require nonstop prayers. He doesn't require 40 days of fasting. He doesn't require anything other than you calling unto him and saying, God, I need help. So why would you want to be a witch? Why would you want to be somebody that was forced to do things in exactly the right way, with the right mindset, at the right time of day, facing the right direction, using the right amount of this and the right amount of that? Why would you choose a religion to do that when you could simply fall upon your face before the Lord and say, God, would you please help me? God, would you please save me? I like that religion better because... If there's one thing I've learned about Mike Hoggard, you cannot expect me to hit a golf ball the same way twice. I've never done it. I have been on a golf course where I took a swing. I remember I took a swing one time with a, with a, with a one wood on a par four. And I hit that ball, and it was the sweetest, most peaceful golf ball flight in the entire universe and it landed just a few feet from the hole and I was going I'm a golf player now and it took me seven tries after that to get that stupid ball in that cup I don't do anything consistently I don't it's just it's how I am but I'm glad I've got a Bible that never changes. Can I get an amen out of God's people? Grant writes in. I'm going to read a couple of emails. Grant writes in and says, Hey, Pastor Hargett, I just had a little bit of revelation while listening to your show today. This sounds a little silly, but I thought I'd share. I was thinking about salvation and belief in Christ. I was concerning what that really means. Does it mean that if you believe that Jesus was a real character in history, which clearly I do, and died for our sins, that you're saved? I think so, dot, dot, dot. But, comma, what is it to believe, question mark? Believing in Jesus is simpatico with believing in the simpatico. That's an interesting word. With believing in the word, right? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. If you believe in Jesus, then you believe the Bible. The two go hand in hand. That was the revelation I just had. I, listen, you got it, man. You Got it. I just wish I had some music or sound effects or something like that to go with you getting it because you got it. I mean, go watch, go watch the video I did this this from this weekend down in Harrison. It was all about equating Christ with his word. You want to get people to believe in Christ, get them to believe his word. If they don't believe his word, they don't believe in the real Jesus. And it's the whole word. You can't just say, well, I believe part of the New Testament. But that Old Testament stuff, that giants and the whale and the water separate, that's, I don't buy that stuff. You're not saved. You don't have the Holy Spirit dwelling in you. You don't have the spirit of truth. You have a spirit of error. You, you, you know how you are unclean. You are unpure because you think that nothing is pure. Grant, God bless you, buddy. Uh, uh uh-oh. Somebody writes in and says, so what would it mean if the Watchman group on May 1st hit 1,111 members? That's where I need the music. Dun, dun, dun! Um, those admins, kick somebody out so we don't have that number. I'm just, I'm not a, I just, I don't really care. Um, I'm not, um, what is it, superstitious? Christina says the tower is the union of the twin towers into one. Hey, that's you're you're right. The two shall become one. Uh, heaven and earth 
uh, gods and goddesses and all that stuff. Also, the spire is actually a minaret. If you see closer, I I believe that one too. Um, Lisa says, "Have you noticed that the tree image is showing up all over the place too? Books, notebooks, etc." Oh yeah, yeah. Type in, uh, go to Google and type in "tree of knowledge." Okay. Anyway, uh, let's see here. Somebody's asking me about a security code. I don't know what that is. Um, Chuck says, the way Washington, D.C. was laid out by Masons, plus they built an obelisk like the Washington Monument, Maypole. Could these be a thorn for the United... I Absolutely, absolutely, I believe that. Uh, Chuck, I did a video called Capital Secrets. I also have a little book on it. And uh, if you've not seen that, I encourage you to do it. It talks about all the layouts in Washington, D.C. Pat, how you doing? Stay away from tornadoes, Pat. Um, Pat, I like you. She said, I commented on this the other day, but the, the phrase, the devil, occurs 46 times in the King James Bible. Go check it out. Go check it out. It's in there. And you know what 23 is? 23 is the number for death. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, Psalm 23. Romans 6, 23, through the wages of sin is death. 23 is the number for death. When you have 46, you have two deaths, second death. And the phrase, the devil, 46 times, when you go read the 46 occurrence of the phrase, the devil, you find that he's thrown into the lake of fire, second death. God bless you, Pat. Uh, the pagans believe in going around the mulberry bush. I like that one. <laughs> Monica from Toronto. Hi, Pastor Mike. Uh, Jimmy Page was strumming along playing a riff, and Robert Plant was sitting there. He said something came over him, and he started to automatically, without thought, write the song. She says, I used to be a big Zeppelin fan. I get it. I get it. And the beginning of Stairway to Heaven, it just lures you in. And, and, I read a little bit about it today. They designed the song or had it designed for them to start out very serene and then end up screaming at the end. And it's all about buying a stairway, Axis Mundi, to heaven. Because harlot women think that everything is about money. That's what it is. Thank you for that. George, my favorite missionary in the whole world. Uh, amen. Let's see here. He says, he says he got the stuff. Glad he got the stuff. Uh, let's see here. Force He's using a military term. Force multiplies a military term used in combat to confuse the enemy to think you are more of you than of them by pushing more bullets down range. In this case, more of the Word of God through DVD production. Amen. You pray for George Limelin. He is up there ministering to the Native American tribe of Ojibwa in Minnesota, a place where the Roman Catholic Church and the Lutheran Church have been there for 350 years and have accomplished absolutely nothing. And he's got an incredible, incredible battle on his hands dealing with those people, but he loves them and he cares about them. And that's why he's there. And so you pray for Pastor George and his, and his wife, um, Kathy, and you pray for their work and labor up there and we we're behind them 100 percent so appreciate that one all oh, that's that's a big one uh let's see here's another one okay katherine coolman that's who i was trying to remember okay thank you km now km says if you're only observing sunday for your worship day then you're doing the same thing as the seven dayers there is no scripture for sunday worship so basically everyone is doing what paul spoke against uh kim you are wrong you are, you're dead wrong. No scripture for Sunday worship? Are you kidding me? You're dead wrong. Okay, just telling you, you are. Appreciate you writing it in. Go read your Bible again. You'll find it. All right? King James for Bible Search software. Go get it. It's Pastor Mike. Aren't you glad we're saved by grace? Amen. See you later, alligator.